How do you keep your motivation consistently high? How do you learn to persevere when the novelty is worn off and you're still some distance from your goal? We'll talk about that in a moment. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats once wrote a poem describing some of the unfortunate characteristics of the modern world. One of the things Yeats noticed was the fact that bad people seem to have the most energy, while good people become discouraged and doubtful of their own abilities. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are filled with a passionate intensity. Those are the words Yeats used. And it's true that we can look around the world and see all sorts of things happen that we might wish were not happening. And there are people working very hard to make those things happen for reasons that we might not admire. And when we see that, it's easy to start saying, what's the use? What hope do I really have? Why don't I just give up on all the things I've been trying to accomplish and just start taking it easy? Even people of strong character feel that way sometimes. All of us have moments like that. That's when perseverance gets really, really tough. What's the answer? Well, you recall that during our discussion of goal setting, I asked you to list five categories for your long-term goals. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? What do you want to have? Where do you want to go? Now I want you to add another one. With whom do you want to share? In other words, who are you working for besides yourself? In the first five categories, you were asked to focus exclusively on your own aspirations and why they were important to you. But now now I want you to think in terms of other people. Who is depending on you? Who will benefit if you persevere and succeed? Who will suffer if you... give up and stop trying? Who can you reach out to and help once you've achieved your goals? Write down answers to these questions just like you wrote answers for the other categories. For many people, the answers will appear quite readily. If you have a family, your spouse and your children are depending on you. Perhaps even your parents are depending on you now, if they're elderly and require some care. But even if you're a single person or just starting out in your career, you can think of reasons to persevere and succeed that go beyond your personal needs. Maybe you would like to share some of your financial success with the school that educated you, or with the religious institutions that gave you spiritual guidance, or with a hospital that helped to heal you on some occasion. This sharing doesn't have to be limited to money either. If your work has given you certain skills, you can share your time and your abilities. You can and you should. But even this isn't putting it strongly enough. It isn't just that you'll do better if you feel you're working for others in addition to yourself. You absolutely must find reasons outside yourself to persevere if you want to keep going when the going gets tough. Hemingway wrote, a man alone hasn't got a chance. And that doesn't mean only that you need people to help you in life. It means also that you need people you can help. You need people who can become the real reasons for perseverance above and beyond your material possessions or your financial success. What's in it for me can only take you so far. What's in it for somebody besides me can take you as far as you need to go. In the last days of World War II, the American cruiser Indianapolis was sunk by an enemy submarine. This was one of the most tragic incidents of the war for American forces, in which hundreds of men lost their lives. Men
Many who made it through the initial attack had to spend days and nights in the water before rescuers arrived. The experience of trying to stay alive in the water was so overwhelming that many people simply gave up. In fact, the survivors reported later that virtually everyone wanted to give up at one time or another, but whenever someone wanted to quit trying, the others would talk to him about the people back home who needed him, who were depending on him to survive. And if there was no one who was depending on him right then, they would talk about people in the future who would someday be needing him, people he hadn't met yet, people who hadn't even been born yet. They conjured up all sorts of reasons above and beyond simply surviving. This motivation beyond the self was the only motivation that was strong enough. And what was true in an extreme sense for those men in wartime is also true in all our lives, no matter what we're trying to accomplish. We began this discussion with some mention of racehorses and how the best of them can overcome any challenge in a race. People stay hungry too. We're hungry all our lives. But exactly what it takes to satisfy our hunger usually changes a great deal. By the time we reach adulthood, some of us are hungry for wealth and power. Some of us are hungry for truth. Some people want everyone to love them. Others want everyone to fear them. But there's a fundamental challenge with all these appetites. None of them can ever be permanently satisfied. When it comes to wanting things, there's never any such thing as enough. And that can really get on our nerves. You get a new car, but in a couple of years, it's an old car. You get a new computer, it does everything real fast. certainly faster than the one your neighbor's got, but then a year goes by and now your neighbor gets a computer that's even faster than yours. Where does it all end? There's really only one kind of person who's actually comfortable with the impossibility of satisfying his appetites. This is the person who wants that mysterious commodity called wisdom, whatever that is, and wants it more than all the cars and computers in the world. Wisdom, like the learning capacity of the human brain, is infinite. There will always be more to know, and there will always be plenty of room in your brain for everything you learn. Life is a paradise, really, if you're a person who genuinely wants wisdom. We all want to be successful, and I'm certainly in favor of that, but I've known some people who literally wanted all the money they could get. Not what the money could buy, but the money itself. The nickels, the dimes, the quarters. Wanting all the money in the world is like wanting to know all there is to know in the world. Except the man who wants all the money is miserable. He'll never get it all, and he'll never think he has enough. Enough. Even if he had rooms filled with thousand dollar bills, he'd still want the next man's nickel. And he'd be in pain about that, filled with envy about it. The man who wants wisdom also wants to look back over his shoulder at the other guy. But he just wants to see what the other guy is reading. And if the other guy is reading a book he hasn't read yet, he's actually happy about it. He looks forward to reading it himself. The acquisition of wisdom is not what all the mathematicians call a zero-sum game. You you don't have to give up something in order for me to have it. You can give me your wisdom and now I'll have it, but you still have it too. When one person shares wisdom with another, neither person is diminished. In fact, both are made wise.
boxer. Giving and taking is such a basic experience for most of us. But the whole concept of giving and taking doesn't really apply to wisdom. There's no giving and taking. There's only sharing. Wisdom is a unique commodity, if indeed it can even be called a commodity. Unlike the other things people hunger for, wisdom is very hard to visualize. We could imagine rooms full of money, but how can you picture a room full of wisdom? Books aren't wisdom. They're just pieces of paper bound together. Books can help create wisdom in people's mind, but if you look inside their heads, you won't find any wisdom there. So what is it anyway? To most people, wisdom seems like something in a distant country, as if it were on a tropical island somewhere. Few people People, if any, have ever seen it, but it's something that everybody's heard reports about. But almost everybody believes wisdom exists, even if they've never seen it. In that sense, wisdom is almost like God, except it isn't a divine quality, it's a human quality, a very rare, very precious human quality. Ask anybody and they will probably tell you that there is such a thing as wisdom. Furthermore, that person will also tell you that he or she hopes someday to become wise. Ask the same person how to become wise, how to get wisdom, and if that person has some wisdom in him, he probably will just smile or nod or tell you to live and look around you and think about what you see and hear.